Hey guys, welcome back to my channel for another episode of Porn Star Confessions. Today I've got super ugh, today I'm super excited. I've got Wade Wolfgar. Welcome. Hello. So salutations. <laughs> yeah, you and I were supposed to shoot together a long time ago and then just I was wondering if you were gonna bring that up. <laughs> yeah. Damn. Um uh, that would have been like 2019, oh, shortly before the pandemic in Vegas for a Raging Stallion movie. I believe it was the, the title was loaded. Um, and I it was supposed to be you, me and Jake Nicola. And then I don't know what happened, but, yeah. but you didn't show up. <laughs> yeah, no, it was not me. It was not my choice. Like, <laughs> you of that. Uh, no, I, I, I didn't mean to like accuse you. I was mostly just joking around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, I wouldn't have missed that. Um, <laughs> damn. All right. Well, I definitely am supposed to work with Steve <clears throat> Cruz again next year. So okay. Yeah. Cool. Maybe. Maybe you and I can work together. That would be awesome. So, Maybe. first question I have, how did you come up with the name? Because that's like a very, I don't know, sounds German to me. I like it. Uh, it the, the Wolfgar is definitely a German name. Uh, I think it's funny because I often say, like, I wish I did, had a different name, uh, mostly because... Wade is my middle name, like my government middle oh. name, which is, I find common among people in porn. A lot of guys do that. Um, and Wolfgar, it started out as Wolf with like W-O-L-F-E. And then uh, at the time I, I was like trying to be, I don't know, like unique and search engine optimized. And I sort of uncovered that there was like eight other people with the name Wolf. And I was like, okay, this is too much. Like I need to do something different. So I just added a G-A-R on the end. And my dad is Danish, which is not German specifically, but it's, yeah. you know, they're in like close proximity. So it sounded, it felt like it made sense. All right. Yeah, no, there are a lot of wolves. Like yeah. a lot. It's almost like yeah. steel. Yeah, <laughs> which to be fair, like some like if you look at like Rocco Steel or Dallas Steel, like they're certainly not the first fucking steals, and they're doing fine, right? Um, but uh, yeah, I just felt like I should push for something a little bit, a little bit further outside the box. Oh well. So how did you first get started? We'll just say in the adult industry, because a lot of people didn't start with porn. Right. Yeah. Uh, it was probably around 2017, I think. Uh, I'll try to condense the story because there's like a lot of superfluous details. But uh, I was living in Victoria, BC. Uh, I was having a bit of a rough time, like in terms of uh, just not really having any money and like getting out of a, a pretty weird relationship that did not go well. Um, and I basically signed up for uh, rent men. Cause I was like, you know, at first I was like, maybe I can be a cam girl, make some extra money here. Um, and then I thought like, okay, like if, if I sign up for rent men and I see somebody and it goes badly and I don't like it, I can just never do it again. And then it didn't go badly. <laughs> So here we are today. Um, but more specifically within that year, somebody from Treasure Island Media hit me up through my Rentman profile and asked me if I wanted to come to Portland to film stuff, which was like insanely nerve wracking for me. But at the same time, I was like, you know, I was saying yes to things. I was very much like, what is the worst? What's the absolute worst thing that could happen realistically? So, and I just decided like, let's do it. So that's, that's kind of how I got my feet wet. Okay. How was S like, I would think for a lot of people, escorting would be more nerve wracking than porn. It sounds like it was, uh, I think, well, first of all, porn didn't really seem like 
realistic for me uh why in, in the place that i was living because there's nobody who films porn there so like oh. and only fans was only fans was a thing but like not like it is now not even yeah. close so so i was kind of like it didn't seem like a like a i needed money now <laughs> it wasn't feasible it's not yeah it didn't seem realistic so um yeah so that's kind of why escorted escorting started first and interestingly enough i would say now with where i'm at making in, making porn independently is easier than escorting in a lot of ways or at least there's not there's still like an expectation like you know your expectations of yourself and that you don't want to let other people down but i think with porn people are can be a little bit more understanding if things go sideways whereas if you're with a client like you need to perform with them you need to like step up and some clients are better than others but uh but i would also say like compared to studio porn escorting is way more chill yeah because the studio porn i mean especially if it's a big studio like there's people who are actually counting on you because it's like literally their job um and with escorting like it's again it, it, go, it changes from person to person they're like client to client but um it's more intimate and because it's more intimate it there's a greater opportunity for you to actually connect with that person and feel comfortable and safe with them and vice versa and i think that's what kind of allows you to provide a better experience for for them and for yourself yeah no that, that all makes sense i'm curious seeing everything that you've seen being around as long as you've been where would you rank them as far as enjoyment like studio fan content escorting what would you like uh, most? I, I, again i it's like i guess if i'm trying to generalize like probably like making independent content then i guess escorting and then studio but also i say that and for me it feels like i have to dig in deeper because I've had clients that make me feel like on top of the world and we have a really good rapport with each other. And like, in terms of like the best of the best escorting experience I've ever had rank the highest for sure, easily. Cause it's yeah. the most rewarding. It's the most gratifying. Um, and in some cases it's the most lucrative. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I think, I think that's where I would kind of rank them. Okay. So do you still escort to this day? Th that would be the other thing. I am not currently escorting <laughs> and um, haven't been for, for like over a year now, which on one hand, it's like I needed to sort of bail on it because I've been in school for the past year and I just needed to like, it was, it's the hardest thing to juggle in yep. addition to the other stuff. Um, so there's that, but also the reason I stopped was just that, like, despite me saying that it can be the best, it can also be the worst. And I found that the, the sort of administrative responsibility of, of dealing with clients and, uh, and just like weird kind of people who ghost you or like do weird stalkery shit. I was just like, I need, I I'm going crazy. I need a break. Yeah. No, I get that. Like, do you, what about like long-term regulars though, that you've been seeing since the beginning? They're amazing. Oh, so you still see them. You just don't take it. Oh yes. Too. Okay. Right. Right. Uh, yeah, no, I do. Okay. There's like a very small handful of, of people that I will continue to see though. Like we're talking, like I could probably count them on one hand. Wow. You and I, sound like we started pretty much the exact same time and are at the exact mm. same spot because i'm the <laughs> same way like yeah i could count the number of clients i'll still see on one hand and i've been yeah, okay. seeing them forever on a regular basis because you're right. right just the bad ones are really bad 
and then yeah. you get like the tax at 10 p.m 11 p.m like fuck this i come too yeah, old like, for this bullshit yeah and it's like there's I, I like to think that i am good at parsing through the like the people who who i don't want to see for just like my own safety or comfort right like yeah. if somebody's like i've from the beginning like there have been exceptions, but like people who are partying, like I almost across yeah. the board won't, won't see them. And I'm very good at telling like this, those tiny little things. If you read between the lines, you're like, yeah, they respond like know. this. That's a dead giveaway. And right. Or if they're mess <laughs> an easy one is if they're messaging you at like 4 30 AM, <laughs> but you know, there's like little things like even in the way that they type or like the pictures that they m might send you or just mm -hmm. there's certain little things where I'm like, mm, I don't think so. Um, uh, what was the point I was going to make with that? Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, sometimes having people like that who are comfortable wasting your time and uh, possibly even like being a dick, just being an asshole. I was just like, I, I, uh, I'm going crazy. Like there, there became a point where I would look at my phone and like, I would get actual messages from like people I care about in my personal life or whatever. And I would be irritated immediately just because like the notifications coming up on my phone. And I was like, I need to take a step back from the escorting <laughs> because I think that's what's triggering this. Yeah, no, I've definitely been there. Just curious. How old are you? I'm 36. Are you sure? Okay. All right. So, all right. You do. How old did you think I was? I can't guess age or shit. <laughs> okay. I was going to say I don't somewhere think I between either. 30 and 40. And the only reason why I said go. 40 is I assume everyone's around my age. So, <laughs> but 36, okay. yeah. And you've got a good build, like good muscle maturity that doesn't happen earlier in life. I mean, I don't know. Have you seen some of these kids? <laughs> Generally speaking, <laughs> I'm not talking about the, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yes. <laughs> Generally. Yeah, that is true. So, all right. So you go, you do your first scene for, uh, Tim. And then where yeah. did you go from there? Uh, well, where I went from there was uh, back into my like little uh, lair, into my little dungeon. Because those scenes, like, I don't want to disparage Treasure Island because they were actually very good to me and like the people that I worked with there. But I had a really hard time performing on camera. Just, and I kind of went into it thinking like, oh, I'm great with clients, like better than I thought I'd be this, I, I'm sure it'll be fine. And then I found like, I was, it was really hard for me to like, get it up and keep it up on camera in that situation. Granted, I was also like, surrounded by people I didn't know in a city I had never been to. Like, you know, there's a lot of things that can mm, spur your anxiety in a situation like that. Um, <laughs> So, uh, and also I just like, wasn't familiar with some of the, uh, pharmaceuticals that are quite common on set these days. Yeah. Um, and so that kind of made me like, maybe I need to take some time before I can like get back into this. Okay. So I just, uh, dealt with some life shit, wound up moving cities again, back to my, the city I live in now where I'm from. Um, and, uh, I started posting shit on Twitter and then I started getting uh, requests from people at like raw fuck club and um, raging stallion. So I did the raw fuck club thing, which was a better experience, but still challenging. And then again, I was like, I don't, I need some time before I'm like ready to try this again. And then we started the raging stallion thing. And then I started feeling a little bit more like I, I kind of, I was a little more confident with, my ability to show up on set and deliver. Yeah. No. And I'm glad you brought that up because in this directed mainly at those of you watching, because you, you'll, I mean, I'm sure you've seen it. Like 
he'll all, oh yeah, I could get it up. I could perform on camera. Uh-huh. Right. The best analogy I have ever been able to come up with for like someone who's not in the industry is be like, try having sex in front of your parents and let me know how that goes. Sure. Yeah. I'm guessing it ain't gonna work. <laughs> Cause it it's hard yeah. to, to put it in language that's relatable. Yeah. Um, like, I, it's, it's funny that you say it's hard to put it in language that's relatable because, like, there are things that I've felt when I've been, like, having sex in front of people in a variety of situations, not just, like, on camera. And there's this distinct, uh, like, sensation that I have when I'm being spectated upon, like, in in real life that I don't, I don't know how to describe, but it's like this weird, um, it's like my brain gets like partitioned and there's this like chunk of my brain that is completely preoccupied with like the people watching and what they're seeing or what they're thinking or whatever that is. And sometimes that part of my brain sort of like being interfered with or like having to split my focus, uh, makes it yeah it just completely interferes with the actual sex that's happening yeah. so it's yeah it's difficult to describe and uh you know i've even i've been on set one time uh with somebody and i was just like basically they were sucking my dick like just off to the side while like people were setting up cameras and stuff and i was doing fine like no issues um and then as soon as the we were in front of the cameras, like I I couldn't make it work. Uh so and like, you know, it's pretty much no secret. At this point, I use Trimix a lot when I'm in a situation like that. Uh because it's an insurance policy, really. <laughs> um but uh but yeah, it's so interesting to be like, I can literally be 10 feet away from where I have to film this video and I can perform basically without any problems. And then as soon as there's lights and cameras and like that, all that attention on you and it, yeah, it just like fucks with your head, man. People, people have no idea. They like to think that they, and I get it. You want to, that's what porn is for a lot of people. It's a fantasy. And part of that fantasy sometimes is thinking like I could do that too. Um, yeah. But like a lot of you can't. <laughs> No, that is that is so true though, because it it is completely different. I mean, for me, the most difficult part when the cameras were rolling was coming. Like I've literally mm. had directors fall asleep waiting for me. Like when someone falls asleep waiting for you to come, that's bad. Yeah, I mean. It's funny because I feel like that's one of the things that obviously I've witnessed other people have that uh, issue on set as well, which I'm super understanding of, but I haven't had that particular issue. Really? I've even had a scene where I couldn't, I basically couldn't get it up. This was a long time ago. I basically couldn't get it up, but I was still able to have a cum shot on camera. <laughs> so like, I don't know, you know, everybody's a little different. <laughs> wow. Okay. All right, so all of the that background stuff, like as far as being in front of the camera, I'm assuming that's all gone now. Um, no, absolutely not. Really? I mean, doing it like doing it uh, in like a for like an OnlyFans video, I have a lot less issues, but I still get those same. Maybe not at the same level, especially because like if in a lot of those, sorry, uh, situations, like I'm more familiar with the people there. Like if I know the staff and the director and the person that I'm shooting with, that's going to make it a lot easier. Um, but I still get those nerves for sure. Really? What oh, do yeah. you do to calm them? Uh, just, I mean, one thing I will say is I have had experiences where like, I'm, I go to a shoot and I'm kind of feeling like the anxiety build and I'll just have like a conversation with one of the other performers that's there and 
like we're all kind of in it together and most of us are understanding of the problems that we've all had that happen at some point or just about all of us have so if you can just have like a chill conversation with with another performer it doesn't even have to be somebody you're in the scene with but i find that that like that brings my anxiety level down big time so just getting to know someone finding common ground with them yeah or like uh just like it, if it's somebody you already know but you're not shooting with them like it oh. can just be like okay i'm this is helping ground me in general you know okay that makes sense okay yeah. so when did you make like your only fans and start doing all your own content uh i guess it would have been around the time that i had shot the first raging stallion video i don't remember exactly but i did spend i probably spent like at least a year on twitter like without trying to do like an only fans or any of that stuff like um and when it's kind of funny a lot when you know you get those questions from people sometimes just like random people who are interested in getting into making porn um, but they haven't really started yet. And a lot of times my advice, which I don't know if it's the best advice, uh, but, um, I'll say like, don't, don't start a Twitter and then start selling your only fans. Like if you want to, if you enjoy being slutty <laughs> on the internet, just do that for a while. Like I probably had a good 50,000 followers before I started like trying to sell an OnlyFans account. I was just posting dick pics for fun, basically. Um, and I think that is a good way to generate a following. Like, you know, if you start out with 150 followers and you're like, you know, just posting, like, here's my OnlyFans link. I don't know. There's something about that that's, to me, feels like, I don't know. I, it doesn't appeal to me. I, I want to see somebody who's like either producing at like a very high level already or somebody who's who I I can I don't know where you just get that feeling of like this person is just like expressing their sexuality because they enjoy it. Yeah. I don't know. My biggest thing going to what you're just saying would be I would want someone established if for no other reason than I would want to be assured that there is going to be regular content posted. I'm not going to subscribe to someone's shit to see two videos. Do you see right. what I mean? Like, I, I want to see content. I see what you mean. Basis. But I also have this, like, good, like, mischievous little grin because I am not good at being consistent and, like... <laughs> <laughs> I, my attitude is like, I produce high quality stuff and, and I try to make sure that everything that I post is like, um, is like as the best that I could possibly make it. Right. So I spend a lot of time like thinking about my picture quality and my angles and like learning how to edit in professional software and like do multiple camera angles and blah, 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 all that shit. And making sure that I have good chemistry and like, yeah. you know not not just winging it all the time in that regard but um but yeah but the, like i have a difficult time in part based on where i live making super consistent output yeah so so sometimes people get you know two or three videos in a month and i'm like okay these better be like the best two or three videos i've ever made <laughs> i mean two or three videos a month that's not bad that's not bad no, that I, I'm talking about. But I think there, I'm talking about the people that have like two videos and then they won't post anything for months and then like that type. Of yeah. Shit. Right. Yeah, you can't expect to generate uh, income or maintain an audience if your output is that shit. But <laughs> like, I guess what I'm saying is uh, there are a lot of people who are kind of at the top of the game who uh, like they post like daily. Right. And sometimes it's like garbage posts, but they post, they post so much. And like, I'm, I can't do that. I'm not interested in that. <laughs> yeah. No, that I get. I could not post daily. No, I, I don't see how you could post daily 
unless, like you said, you're posting garbage. Like, is, the, you know, I think sometimes these people post like two scenes a week or maybe one scene a week, but like two scenes a week. And then they're posting like pictures every day, stuff like that. You know, I think I've actually asked my followers before, um, do you prefer like an OnlyFans creator who treats OnlyFans like Twitter or who treats OnlyFans like, like Pornhub or something by which I mean, like, do you want, do you prefer somebody who's like, they're constantly feeding you something like, even if it's just a selfie and then maybe they post like a, a long form video once in a while, but they're like constantly giving you little bits and pieces or somebody who's like everything they post is like a gallery of, of a photo shoot and like high quality videos but you only get a post maybe once or twice a week, if that. And it's actually kind of an even split among the polls that I've done. Wow. Yeah. I'm going to have to, okay, I'm going to post some poll like that <laughs> after we get done with this, because now I'm super curious. Wow. Okay. I, and this is just a, this is just a theory on my part. I haven't, I haven't done another follow-up poll, but if I had to guess, I'd say that the people who enjoy the, the, like the feed of co consistent content are probably in the younger bracket and the people who want like kind of more polished curated material are probably in an older bracket. I would put my money on you being absolutely 100% correct. Yeah. Yeah, no. And I, I don't know about you, but. I think most of my subscribers are older. I know most of the viewers of this show are older. It's like my number one demographic on this show is like 45 to 60 or something. Maybe okay. it's 50 to 60. Interesting. Yeah. So, okay. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think I, I kind of wonder if like, because I think a lot of, um, the older generation are still sort of enamored with like the, the porn world as they knew it when, when it was, you know, the way it was when they were like middle-aged or, or younger. Um, and I think maybe like the younger generation, the way that they consume porn and the way that they even conceptualize like the porn industry is completely different, right? Like to think of oh. porn the way that it was in like the year 2000 when it was all like generated by studios and everybody was handpicked and, and everybody was white and hairless <laughs> and cut. <laughs> um, you know, the way that they conceive of the porn world is very different. And I think maybe uh, it doesn't have like, like interviews and stuff, may, maybe that could be wrong about this. And I'm sure there's many exceptions, but like maybe doesn't have the same um, mystique that it does for the older generation. Huh. Interesting. That all makes a lot of sense. Like a lot of sense. Because I should be asking them though. <laughs> yes. No, I will put up a poll. And if you're watching this video, please let us know in the comments, please. I'm super curious. And I also think another thing it factors in is the young generation is like, you know, they're being brought up on TikTok and all that. So they're used to that, you know, shorts and reels and TikToks and they're, it's like they don't have the attention span for anything longer. I mean, I think there's some truth to that, but I also think that there's like a lot of, a lot of stuff that I watch on YouTube or podcasts that I listen to, like have a huge following among younger people, right? Like, oh. so I don't, it's not, I don't think they're completely incapable of watching long form content. Uh, but, but I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to go any deeper than that on the, uh, yeah. but yeah. Okay. So one thing I meant to ask you, um, and before I forget what happened to your shoulder, cause I saw a post about that. Mm. You can actually kind of see the bruising on it right yeah, now. Yeah. I actually just noticed this today because like I can't see it in the mirror, but like the 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 way the camera picks up color, I can see it in the webcam image. But um okay. <laughs> I'm gonna try not to make this the longest story ever. Uh but basically in August of last year, I was like 
training super hard. I was doing really well. I was very happy with where my body was at. Um, and I was having a little, I've always had a bit, of, a little bit of a janky shoulder, but it never really interfered with anything. What do you mean? And then, janky? uh, I janky, just like, you know, I would get like a little bit of like a pinch there sometimes, or, you know, like certain, certain planes of movement, I would kind of avoid, um, and you know, my range of movement in certain okay. ways was like, not great, but uh, during that time, when I was, and I was lifting a lot heavier, uh, I, I had a couple sessions where like I pushed through some pain that I probably shouldn't have. And then all of a sudden I couldn't do pull-ups anymore. Like, it, like it was just super painful. So I went to physio that helped, but I just knew there was something else going on. And, uh, so I got some x-rays taken and went to an orthopedic clinic and they said, uh, it looks like what you have is calcific tendonitis. So basically in the supraspinatus, which is like the muscle that is on the top of your shoulder blade, and then it comes underneath your shoulder bone and connects to the top of your arm bone. It's one of the rotator cuff muscles. And it's the most common place for this to happen on, on people, but it can happen in other places. But basically, for whatever reason, my body has been like throwing calcium into that tendon to try and repair it or something. But it's actually just making things way worse. <laughs> so, uh, so I essentially have like this gooey rock of calcium in that tendon that's was making it more painful and frustrating to work out. But I could still kind of work around it. And then maybe like four months ago, it started getting really bad. But luckily by then I had kind of, uh, pushed, pushed through the healthcare system to a degree. And I just recently got an operation done on it to get rid of the calcification and I'm just recovering now. Jesus. So do yeah. you have to be out of the gym for a certain period of time? Fuck. Yes. Super. Um, it's very frustrating because like I've had to sort of uh, temper my workouts like a lot in the past year and a half just, be, be just because of it in general. And then now because I'm in recovery and I don't want to fuck up the tendon, which has just, you know, kind of like I didn't get cut open or anything. The surgery, the surgery is much different than that. Um, but you know, it still can sort of compromise the integrity of the tendon. So they said no heavy lifting for a month, which for me as a gym going person means like, if you know, I'm used to lifting heavier than the average person. So I should probably wait longer to try and get back to where I was. And uh, so yeah, and they said that it would be like back to normal, like at 100% again within six months. So I'm probably going to start doing some like physio and some like body weight exercises. Well, physio stuff like right away as yeah. soon as I can, but body weight exercises within about a month and then I'll slowly taper myself back up. But uh, Fuck, it's required a lot of patience <laughs> and, I'm and I'm sad that my, I, I'm happy with my body in general, but I'm sad that I've lost a lot of the gains. Dude, I feel you. Like, I have a hernia on my belly button that I've been putting off getting fixed for over a year now. Just because six weeks of no gym, I'm like, fuck yeah. that. That's the worst yeah. part. Yeah. So and something that's in your, like, abdomen, that's in your core, that affects everything. Mm -hmm. Right? Like... I could go to the gym and probably do squats right now and it then be fine. Right. Or, yeah. or like whatever, leg press or something. It's not going to involve my arm at all. Um, although I'm still not doing that because I'm like so afraid of fucking something up, yeah. but like, yeah, if you have a hernia, like what do you can't, can't do, anything. do anything? Like, <laughs> okay. So my, my next question is how the fuck are you not going crazy during this? Oh, I am. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I mean, okay. So one thing that has sort of helped me out 
is like in the past year I've been in school for massage therapy. So like I've kind of been preoccupied with school. Um, and that has helped me like, even though I've still kind of go to the gym, but like, it's mostly like, you know, it's like, I'm doing this for maintenance. We're not doing gains anymore. This is all maintenance. Yeah. <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. So I've been doing maintenance workouts for the past fucking year, but it's been kind of okay. Cause I'm like, okay, well I need school to be like the number one thing anyway. Yeah. Um, and then of course I have my other responsibilities, uh, and like trying to make a living on top of that. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of kept me sane. And then I've been on break from school at the starting in the middle of October. And what I found myself sort of veering back to is like, uh, a little bit of drawing, a little bit of art stuff. Cause I have a, a degree in fine arts and I don't really practice anymore, but like I've been, you know, dabbling in things. And, uh, and then I started kind of getting <laughs> dis distracted, uh, by Twitch streaming. So I've been like streaming on Twitch, like drawing and playing video games and the playing video games on Twitch with like, you know, a, a small slice of my audience has been kind of a fun way to spend the recovery process because what, what am I going to, I can't like the other day I did laundry and that was like a big deal because previous to that, I'm like, I can't cook for myself. I can't, do laundry like I, I couldn't move this arm more than like an inch in any direction uh so you know i couldn't even wipe my ass with my good hand <laughs> jesus man that... but so that yeah wow are you making money doing but you know Twitch? um technically yes but like not i don't okay. consider it uh income i'm just like things have worked out timing wise in a way and also a little bit by design uh where i recently was in berlin and this was before the surgery um and i was able to generate some videos out of that trip that are kind of carrying me through the recovery time so gotcha. i can maintain like consistent output for only fans and only fans is already kind of like a it's not a passive income, but it's like a semi-passive income. Yeah. You know? So yeah. what made you choose massage school? I, a few things. One, I just thought I'd be good at it because I, you know, have done massage for people as an escort without any training. And, uh, oof, and I've always gotten good reviews on that. Um, and I felt like I had a good instinct for it. And, uh, and then on top of that, like the other reason is kind of, um, I don't know how to describe it finicky in a way, because I'm trying to eventually move to the States to be with my partner. And I wanted to be able to like go into, you know, like an immigration agent's office and not have, not, not like question what I'm going to say to them. Right. So if they're like, what are you doing for a living? Or like, how are you going to make money? Or, you know, uh, what is your, like, what is your profession or whatever? And there are things that I could rely on to get past that, but like, they make me nervous and I don't yeah. want to find myself balking at like an immigration <laughs> official. And yeah. so if I say, I just, you know, I just got a new education, um, and I'm like doing massage therapy, I feel like I can sort of lean on that. Um, and it's not like I'm doing it completely for that reason. I also like doing massage and I am good at it. Um, okay. but, and it's also a two year program, which is fairly fast and, uh, and will allow me to get into those, those meetings and into the States that much faster. Wow. Okay. Cause that was going to be one of my questions earlier was you ever plan on moving? Yeah. So your partner lives where in california la or no oh, okay all right how long have you guys been together for uh at this point um 
four years, over four years. You yeah, we've been in long distance for over four years. A long distance relationship for four fucking years. Yeah, dude. Through COVID, our, our relationship started and then COVID happened. <laughs> Wow, that, what's your secret? Uh, I don't know that there's a secret. It's like a handful of just like good things, which are one, we communicate with each other very, very, very well. And we're almost like probably annoyingly, uh, like, um, not confident, uh, just it takes priority in our lives big time. Like our ability to communicate is very important to us just independently of each other. So coming together as a couple, like we need to be able to communicate well with each other just to satisfy our own like fucking soul or whatever. But on top of that, me being a sex worker, you need to have that communication that much more. Yeah. Right. Um, and then also I think, I don't know, like, I haven't been in a ton of relationships in my life and that's not because I couldn't, I couldn't be in a relationship. It's just because I'm selective and I have, you know, high standards, I, I, I guess. And I've been in some situations with people who were really bad for me and kind of abusive and I don't want to make the same mistakes. And, you know, I found, I found somebody who like is, is all of those things and makes me happy and is fun and interesting. And like, and you know, there's like a, there's an old, um, what's her name? Um, there's an old Ani DeFranco lyric where she says, I know there is strength in the differences between us. And I know there's comfort in where we overlap. And I think that's how I feel about the relationship. Okay. And how did you two meet, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, we met at Vancouver Pride. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, a lo uh, another, another quick little story. Uh, we, have, we have mutual friends who live in Vancouver. They, they were a couple uh, that were kind of like this semi-well-known uh, like pair of daddies. Uh, very, very, if they ever see this you guys are lovely. Um, and, uh, they were hosting him for pride and I was, uh, basically didn't plan on going to this pride festival, but Rocco Steele had reached out to me and he was, he had been hired for an event there and he and I had been like chatting here and there leading up to that. And he was like, Hey, like, are you going to be in Vancouver for this? Um, and I was like, well, I wasn't planning on it, but maybe I could, like maybe we could figure something out. So I went to Vancouver mostly to film with Rocco and uh, I mean, which was sidebar. That was great. <laughs> Don't zero regrets. <laughs> um, and then, um, but these, these mutual friends that we had were like, Hey, we're, we have this friend staying with us. We think you guys would really like each other, and, but they just met sexually. Uh, like, oh. do you want to, we think it would be fun if you showed up at the bathhouse um and you know be like sort of a surprise like for him um because they were trying to treat him or something and i was like yeah i'm down um and then i never actually made it to the bathhouse that night because i was just too busy with the gigs that i had planned um but long story short we ended up meeting under other circumstances that weekend and really hitting it off so wow yeah damn I'm just blown away <laughs> that you have made a long distance relationship work for that long. I think that's phenomenal. And yeah, it, it, I guess the, I guess the other secret is like, don't, well, I almost said this in a terrible way. You have to be earning a certain amount of money because we fly to see each other. We try to make it at least once a month, which doesn't always work out, but, um, but, you know, we try to see each other and fly back and forth, like, as much as we, like, realistically can, right? And we both feel like when, 
when two weeks goes by, we start feeling it. And when a month goes by, it starts getting like, this feels weird. I don't like it. And, uh, and so when you like are waiting two months or more to see each other, it's like, man, this fucking sucks. Like, so we try to maintain a regular sort of ritual of being able to see each other and you need flexibility and, t and money to pull that off. And luckily we both have relative flexibility and like a decent income. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's another big part of it. And then also you have to kind of be creative, like liking each other is great, but you have to invest the time into finding ways to spend time apart that still feel connected. Right. So we have all sorts of, we do a date night once a week over FaceTime where we'll like cook together or watch a movie or play board games or whatever. So you, you have to maintain that. Yeah. That's, um, that's, that's remarkable. And that would get very, very, very expensive very quickly. So yeah, we make it work. Okay. <laughs> so the goal is to move to California then. Yeah. Okay. And what are your interests outside of all this stuff? Like, I mean, you said gaming, but I'm just going to assume that's because your shoulder. Assuming your shoulder was perfectly healthy, what are you doing with your free time? Um, I mean, I would be in the gym a lot more. <laughs> we know that already. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I play Dungeons and Dragons, like tabletop Dungeons and Dragons with like oh, wow. a group of other gay guys locally. So that's a weird, fun thing. Um, you know, uh, I, I don't do it a lot locally, but when I travel, I like to go to parties and circuit parties and shit like that sometimes. Um, I... What else? I don't know. I spend a lot of time just like hanging out, uh, watching shows, movies, uh, occasionally going like hiking or snowboarding or what have you. Um, I don't know. What the fuck do I do with my time? Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I feel like I'm blanking on what I do with myself, but, um, I don't know. I spend time with friends and loved ones and I like cooking a lot. I spend a lot of time cooking. Um, yeah. Okay. Any favorite shows or movies? Uh, let's see. I mean, I, I'm trying to think of what I'm watching right now, which, um, I'm not like in the middle of any series right now. Um, you have like, but I don't know if we want to like list series. That's like, there's some classics, right? There's like, uh, like Sense Eight is a great show. It's a timeless show, as far as I'm concerned. Um, uh, what else comes to mind? Uh, there's so many shows that I've seen. Uh, they're all <laughs> they're all competing for a spot in my brain. Um. I watch a lot of animated stuff. I like a lot of animated shows. So I recently watched um, uh, Blue Eyed Samurai is a thing that came out on Netflix recently. That was pretty decent. Um, actually, here's a here's a movie. Uh, I watched an animated movie semi recently called Strange World, which didn't receive the kind of like publicity that I often expect from like big budget, like polished animated movies. I had never even heard of it, oh. but my partner put it on and it's so trippy and like really fun to watch, really interesting, like a, 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 a kind of, a kind of th a theme that's been done before about like kind of, you know, respecting the earth or whatever, but like done in a way I don't think I've quite seen before. It was a little, it had like a, some new things sprinkled in there. And also had like a very blase kind of uh, representation of queer people in it. And I'm, you know, I'm finding that that's something that I appreciate in movies and TV is when they have queer characters, but it's yeah. like, but it's, it's not a part of the plot line necessarily. Yes. They're just treated, they're just treated as normal people. Yeah. 
no, I, I agree with that. Do you ever see The Wire? I've never watched The Wire. There's so many cultural blind spots for me. And I know that The Wire is like one of the greatest series ever yes. made, but I've never watched a single episode. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know. I have to... Uh, go on, go on. What you just said reminded me, because there's one of the main characters in uh, The Wire is this black guy. His name's Omar. And he is like the most feared motherfucker in like right. the hood. Like he robs drug dealers. And when he walks down the streets, like everybody fucking runs. And he's gay. Right. And I just like, I was like, okay, I like that. You got like the fucking badass motherfucker who's gay, but it's not like this big deal. Does that make sense? Yeah. I really like uh, the way for sure. Did it. There's a, it reminds me of, okay, so quick preface, I went to art school and when I was in art school, well, and before then and after then, I was very much into like street art, graffiti, murals, like that kind of thing was my bread and butter. And there's a graffiti artist from New York, his, his like pen name was Ear Snot. <laughs> um, but I always really liked him and respected him a lot because he's like this super huge, like uh, black guy. Uh, I think... I don't know where in New York he's from originally, but like he was, he's gay and he's been openly gay for a long time. And his attitude about it is just like, especially at that time in like 2009 or whatever, where I was like exposed to this is like, he was just so fucking badass and had a, like all these people that respected him as an artist and as like a graffiti person and he owned a shop in New York and people respected him as kind of in all these facets. And he used to actually run with a crew of other writers where they would go out and they would like straight bash the gay bashers. Like they would seek out guys who were like trying to start shit with gay guys and they would fuck them up, which, oh. you know, I'm not condoning violence, but <laughs> like, you know, there's something about that, that it's, I find you know, kind of respectable or endearing in a way where it was right. like, I'm not going to let that stop me from being badass as fuck. Yeah. No, it's like beating up the bully. I, I don't think that's yeah. really a bad thing. I think you'd be hard pressed to find someone who would disagree with beating up the bully. But, and I'm, yeah, I mean, it's, it's also a situation where it's like, these aren't theoretical attacks. They're like, actively going after people who are like going to harm someone yeah. right so it's yeah oh that's cool so going back to bodybuilding assuming like your shoulders 100 percent, right what would your ideal body be where do you where do you feel like you would be satisfied with what you see in the mirror and the body dysmorphia yeah. would go away <laughs> Right. Where do you feel like you'd be satisfied? Because it's, you're never, you never actually get satisfied. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, there's like a, there's a handful of people who I think like have a sort of like a body that I would, if I could maintain that or somewhere around there, I'd be like pretty satisfied, I guess. I'm sure I would still have some of the demons or whatever. Uh, but um, I don't know his last name, but Terry, he's like Dan Savage's Harry husband. Cruz? Do you know who I'm talking oh, about? Oh, no. Never mind. You know who Dan Savage is? Sounds insanely familiar. He's like a very well-known uh, sort of sex uh, writer, I guess you could say. And he was uh, he was like an advice columnist in... A publication i can't remember which one right now for a very long time okay. um and he's kind of well known for providing like very queer friendly and like sound advice and knowledge about like navigating sex sex and relationships like especially outside of your typical dynamics right oh. people who are polyamorous people who are you know uh maybe I don't know if transgender people are like a forte of his, but he'd be very open to like looking at that from a thoughtful lens. Anyway, 
he has a husband who's really hot <laughs> and i mean dan savage is hot too but his husband is just like uh has an incredible body uh and i've always thought of him as somebody who i sort of aspire to look like in, in terms of their condition and weight or whatever um and who else i know that there's other people who i've looked at and been like that or you can think of um i don't know like i don't know there's something about like mainstream actors where i do i almost don't look at their bodies as like something i am pursuing I don't know why that is. I think maybe it's a little bit because a lot of actors like they get they get the body for the role or for the character, but they don't actually maintain that in their day to day oh, life. Oh, like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. All and right. so I almost don't look at I almost don't look at them as like having that body. It's like because it, it's always temporary for them, or not most of the time anyway. But you know, I guess yeah, sure. Like a, a Henry Cavill at his best. Give me that. <laughs> okay, that's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. Fog. I mean, like, okay, you got Jason Statham, Terry Crews, The Rock. But yeah, I, I think other than those three, you're absolutely right that they, like, Jason Momoa will achieve a body for a certain role. And even Jason Momoa is flat out said, he's like, I don't touch a weight unless they're paying me to do it. He's like, I fucking hate this shit. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> like, wow. Okay, appreciate the honesty. Yeah. I mean, and like what? Maybe Vin Diesel or something. Yeah. Uh, and like a lot of, there are action stars who are like, because they always have those roles, kind of are like that, I think. But like, and then I look at like, Okay, Jason Statham's a good one. Like, yeah, he's got a great body, and uh, and I definitely aspire to his look a little bit. But like, I also like the idea of having the Rock's body is not not uh, unappealing, but like his body type and my body type are fucking very different. So I don't really look at somebody like that and think. I want that body because I'll never have the body they have. Like we're just too different genetically. Wow. I think that's a really good way of looking at things because I think I don't want to say this. I think it's very healthy of you to only compare yourself or idolize something that you know is achievable. Because I think a lot of people compare themselves or, you know, like you said, they'll look at The Rock and be like, oh, I'd love to look like him. I want to look like him when they don't realize that genetically they're totally different. And like you said, it's impossible. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I mean, even even people who like maybe started with like a similar frame that I have, like, you know. Uh, there, sure. Like if I'm looking at like a Mr. Olympia stage bodybuilder, one of them might've looked like me when they started, but like, I'm never going to put that many steroids in my body. Not that I'm against steroids necessarily, but like, I'm still never going to look like them. Right. Yeah. And yeah, I, I don't know. I am kind of sensitive to that entire topic because I feel like, especially going to art school where they kind of try to teach you to be critical of fucking everything in popular oh. media. Like I, I developed a, a keen eye for, um, for sort of critiquing the, like the supposed, and I guess this is kind of like in the common vernacular now, or people are aware of it, but like the, you know, the unrealistic beauty standards that are like, transmitted to us through advertising and movies and media and blah, 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 blah. Um, and I, but the thing is like, that's never changed within my lifetime and I don't see it changing in the future, right? They're always going to be putting beautiful people at, you know, on these advertisements and stuff. And there have, well, I guess I shouldn't say that there haven't been changes. Now you are seeing interesting things like sometimes 
different body types or like heavier people or people with vitiligo are apparently like super desirable as models now. What's that? Um, that's like um, when people who have like generally like more melanated skin, oh, so particularly okay. black people or, or like ha biracial people, when they have those like weird splotches yeah. that are um, completely white or unmelanated. Um, when, and I've started to see a lot of like models with vitiligo, which I think is really cool. Um, yeah. but, um, but still beautiful people are always going to, you know, beautiful people going to beautiful people. Like it's always going to be at the forefront of advertising and media and I, working in porn. I'm like, how do I reconcile those two things? Right. Because I am kind of trying to present like an, uh, an idealized image of myself that kind of mirrors that, right? Like yeah. that other people are going to look at and say, like, I feel inferior to this in some way. Right. And so I feel like the way, the way that I reconcile that within myself is to be incredibly honest and to try and have realistic expectations of myself and like, hopefully I can transmit that to the, like, to the people in my audience. And, and I don't know, maybe that'll make us all better or something. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I get what you're saying. And I agree. It will, it is starting to change. And I think one of the things that's helping it change is the fan sites because I've seen a lot of models that are really, really big or dwarfs or they have yeah. massive followings. It's insane. Yeah, that's true. So that. Yeah. Yeah. Some of these models are probably making like 10 times what I make. <laughs> and like, I'm not fucking around. Like, I don't know what their numbers are, but like, I see, I see their follower counts. I see how many like comments and, and likes and shit their posts get. And I'm like, this person is making 10 times what I make. Like Garrett, yeah. they have to be. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. No, it's so true. And you know what? I say good for them because yeah, good for them. You know, the, the, the fans are voting with their dollars because like you're talking about previously in porn, it was whoever the studio execs decided to cast. And that was it you know, the public had no say whatsoever. Yeah, exactly. So. Although I do wish that they would still pay you like five grand for a studio scene. <laughs> That'd be nice. <laughs> yeah, no, that, those days are long gone. <laughs> yeah. So what does the future look like for you? Oh, I don't know, man. Uh, I... I'm very much like a, like short term goals kind of oriented person. Oh. Like, I don't think too much about where I'm going to be in 10 or 20 years. Um, and even like five years is kind of, I don't know, that's hazy for me. Um, but, you know, I know that I'm going to finish school. I know that I'm going to try to get into the US. Um, and there's going to be a lot of unforeseen obstacles and challenges just in those things. Um, yeah. But what I would like something that I kind of envisioned for myself is uh, once I'm have those things figured out, I'm kind of interested maybe in having like a little bit of a like Wade Wolfgar revival moment by which it's not like I've disappeared from the porn scene or anything, but I haven't been able to film a studio scene in a long time and not like being in a, the studios is like the goal for me necessarily, but I, I'm kind of envisioning this, this arc for myself where I can get into the States and spend like a year or something, just like really trying to get a lot of like publicity and, um, you know, like I, I truly, I truly do not give a shit about winning porn awards, <laughs> but to be in those conversations is like, you, you know, people who get in those conversations, it's because they're working. Right. And so I would, uh, love to have like a year where I'm just like 
spend a, like a lot of time trying to grow okay. my my brand i guess yeah. um i i don't i don't like thinking of my of myself as a brand so much but i guess i am so uh i would like to sort of do that and then um i don't know i don't know what comes after that <laughs> okay no i i like that you have a very pragmatic approach to things and i think that once you move to the u.s and you're in california i think that would be the perfect time for the revival well then i mean you know, every time to fly you all over well yeah there's that and then it's like for the only fans content and shit well and suddenly i have a giant fucking pool of people that i can shoot with on on relatively short notice whereas like right now and for the past five years the way everything has gone is like every time i visit a place i'm like okay i have to i have five days to like do as much as i can and but also not set up so many things that i fuck people over because yeah. you know i have a battery and i'm very wet, aware of how quickly my battery depletes and if i'm doing a if i'm shooting a scene every day because i'm trying to max out like uh, you know my time in that city or whatever like that's a lot of strain for me yeah. uh and you know if i started trying to like do two scenes a day or do a scene every day for two weeks like i'm i'm gonna start canceling and flaking on people and i don't want that i want to have i want to maintain my good reputation <laughs> so yeah uh so like doing this sort of like burst style uh like fans content creation like it's not ideal. I would like to have more access to people more casually. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I get that. I'm curious, though, and this is just for me personally. When you travel to a city and you, yeah, I'm assuming you uh, schedule your collabs like prior to going there, right? Not every time. Okay, <laughs> but well, let's you know, assume if, you do. If I'm, what if I'm being good? actually show up like what percent don't cancel um most people don't cancel like oh. i i'm sure it's happened a few times but i actually can't think of an example off the top of my head um and i i guess i'd like to think it's because i have a good reputation and people don't yeah. want to fuck me around and also like because I don't live there they know they're not going to get that opportunity again anytime soon so i think there's like a little bit of that that might enter it, that it enter sense. into it because i i do know other people where it's like they're like i can't get anybody to fucking show up like they all flake on me and i'm like oh, i don't i don't know what that's about <laughs> sorry yeah all right yeah no because i i don't travel for collabs but every once in a blue moon i'll see a performer tweet out like i just went to the city and had five people flake on me or whatever i'm just like eh, yeah that makes me real gun shy yeah. to the whole thing yeah um i actually have, I have a question for you now um how do you feel about the language that we've sort of adopted in in the like porn world especially like the only fans independent porn world of like content creation and collaboration and terms like that that are sort of these like sterilized words for porn do you and do you it, find yourself using them without really thinking about it or yeah i mean i don't know i i never really gave much thought to it like i always just say like you know let's say i was going to you know, your city, I'd be like, hey, you know, do you want to shoot together? I, I don't find sure. myself using, actually, I can't think of a single time I've ever used the word collab. You just said it in a sentence, like a minute ago. Oh, well, like, I'm talking about, <laughs> I'm talking about like talking to another person. Like, okay. oh, hey, do you want to collab? That, that has never come sure. out of my mouth. Yeah, no, I'm not talking about like this conversation. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I just asked someone, hey, do you want to shoot together? But yeah, no. I, right. Interesting. What do you think? 
I mean, I'm kind of aware that it's so in it's all it's very quickly become ingrained into the culture of of porn production that I'm forcing myself not to be uh too judgmental or like opinionated about it but i do there is a part of me that feels a little bit like i have this little chip on my shoulder for some reason where like i think for me like porn watching porn consuming porn like making porn i want to make porn i want to make porn i don't want to make content I don't want to collaborate. I want to have hot fucking sex on camera. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I know like, what you mean. Okay. Fair enough. There, there's something about this, like the vernacular of, or like the, the, the vocabulary of it, which like takes it away from the realm of something that's like steamy and like sultry and, you know, risky or whatever. And, and puts it in this thing where it's like, I'm asking, like, if somebody says, do you want to make porn with me? I'm like, okay, like, I'm, I'm already like, there's like a, a, a spark of arousal in that. And if somebody says, would you like to collaborate with me? I'm like, wow, like, it sounds so like, I don't know, mechanical. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I get it. It, it basically sounds like uh if it, it feels less like i want to like, make hey, a video you want to go because... do laundry together like that yeah okay yeah all right it's like the i feel like if somebody says do you want to make porn i'm like okay they're interested in my the way i look or the way i behave or that they think there would be some kind of chemistry there oh. whereas like sometimes like you know if somebody says do you want to collaborate i'm like okay so this is like purely for your for your business right like it it you know you see you see my account and you see i have x amount of followers and that i have a maybe a good reputation and it's it's not like you're hot i want to make something fun with you it's like you have a good following and i want the exposure and that's it like i'm not interested in making good porn i'm just interested in getting the the numbers or whatever and i don't think that's how most people treat it i know a lot of people who use the word collab and content and they're like totally respectable people that i've had great experiences with it's just a personal thing that like you know it's like a tiny little pet peeve that i have no i get but it i'm I curious mean, if you had any no no that that definitely makes sense and i know exactly the type that you're talking about because there's not that there it's fuck how do i say this <laughs> it it i know exactly what you're talking about because it it's missing that that sexual tension it's not like hey you know i love your look or you've got an amazing body or i think you have a super sexy dick or you know i i loved your interview or Something is just like you said. It's it's very mechanical. It's like, oh, look at Wade. He has X number of followers. That means that this video will be pretty popular. And it's yeah. almost like, yeah, fuck that. Hell no. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it's like, uh, yeah. I was just curious. Oh. Yeah, no, I definitely, I know the type. I know exactly what you're talking about. Oh, all right. So I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask in the off chance. Like off camera, your private life, would you say you're more introverted or more extroverted? I say uh, a baseline simple answer, introverted. But... Uh, I will say there was like a time where I, you know, I've always felt like an introverted person, very like bullied art kid growing up, that kind of shit. Um, and I remember like maybe a couple years deep into doing porn. Um, somebody asked me that question 
And I remember thinking like, I'm so much more like forthcoming with people now than I used to be that like, I don't know if I can still say I'm introverted. Like I'm really open with sharing about my life and my experiences. Um, I'm way more friendly. Uh, I'm way more just talkative and, um, and like, you know, even if it's for work, like if I go to like a club and I'm dancing on stage or if I go to some kind of event and I'm like fucking somebody in like a crowd full of people, I'm like, can I still call myself introverted? Yeah. And the person I was, the person I was talking to said, okay, let me ask you this way. When you're not doing any of those things or like not, not okay, back up. They asked me, how do you feel like it, you recharge? Do you recharge like your, your, your battery by mm. like being around another person and having that social interaction? Or do you recharge by like spending time at home alone, focusing on like something else? And I was like, for sure alone at home yeah. easily. Like that, that wasn't even a question in my mind. So, and they were like, well, that says to me that you're more introverted. Yeah. And I was like, okay, got it. I like that. That's yeah. No. Cause what made me think that you were an introvert was when you were talking about, uh, traveling and shooting with people and you're like, I've got a battery and it's only got so much before I was like, yeah, you're definitely yeah. an introvert. For sure. And I find a lot of people that you may not think that about in porn yeah. are like that i would say 90 percent of the porn stars i've interviewed are introverts like there's yeah. very very few that are extroverts like silver steel's an extrovert there's a few others but most are introverts yeah so shit yeah okay i mean it's interesting because you think of somebody who does porn like oh they must be so comfortable being around other people and just like not be at all anxious or worried about anything because like how else could you be in porn but i think what it is actually is that we're all fucking control freaks and like there's actually a certain amount of control that you have as an individual when you're working in porn which like that's been my experience and a lot of other men's experience maybe in prior eras of porn that wasn't quite so true and also for women or like trans people that might be like a whole different conversation but you know yeah. that's what i think about the gay the gay men at least yeah no i i would agree with that so one of my last questions and i asked this to everyone i'm hoping you don't fuck up the streak so no <laughs> pressure but if you could have sex in only two positions for the rest of your life which ones and why um missionary okay. and doggy style okay i think 99 um, of people said missionary so good yeah i think like you can't go how you can't go wrong. <laughs> what is there not to like about it? And like, also I will say like, because, and I, I think you can, you can maybe attest to this a little bit. Um, like I don't have at least what I would consider to be like the typical, uh, shape for a penis. Um, you know, I have like a downward curve. I have like kind of a bloated middle yeah. part and, not everybody is used to that and not everybody like can can the sometimes the positioning changes for people when yeah. your dick is shaped differently than what they're used to yeah. but i would still say missionary is like one of one of the most comfortable and one of the best and yeah agreed okay all right we're on you have to choose at least one position where you can see the other person's face right like <laughs> you would think you would think I would assume that, but yeah. Okay. All right. So something about you that people would never expect. Uh, okay. I think I have one. I guess I'll just use that one. Um, 
I've been like weirdly uh, fixated and and like a huge um, fan, I guess, or like a watcher of battle rap for a very long time. What? And yeah, so like you know, I think a lot of people are familiar with the concept of rap battles. Like you're talking like Eminem rappers. and Eight Mile. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. All right. So, I mean, the format has, like, kind of changed over time, and it's different than you than what is in 8 Mile nowadays. But, like, it's a, it's a big thing in a lot of places, and uh, I'm weirdly obsessed with it and have been since, like, I don't know, like 2009 or something. Wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I would have never, I, I pro- ever... I promise you all... <laughs> I promise you all I'm not going to become a rapper... <laughs> You're right. I would have never guessed that in a million years. <laughs> okay. So for anyone who's watching this, who's like, oh my God, Wade's amazing. Where can they find you on Twitter, OnlyFans, anything and everything you want to plug? Okay. What I'll say first and foremost, www.wadewolfgar.net. I couldn't get the .com. Fuck you, whoever has the .com trying to trying to sell it for three thousand dollars oh um but all my links all my links are on my website just go to wade wolfgar w-a-d-e-w-o-l-f-g-a-r dot net all my links are there but i'm on only fans i'm on just for fans i'm on for my fans uh you can if you want to geek out and like do you know see a bit more of this side of me then like Come, come find me on Twitch. Uh, I've also been interested in, in doing more stuff on Chatterbait lately. I think that's oh. an avenue that I haven't explored enough. So um, there's that. Uh, yeah. Come go to my website. All my shit's on my website. Okay. All right. And if you are lazy, you can find Wade's Wolf site in the bio of his Twitter, which is just at Wade Wolfgar. Yeah, at Wade Wolfgar on Twitter. Uh, no, no weird spelling or fancy characters. Good. All right, and then uh, last thing, do you want to explain the Todd from Mario? Because I'm sure people will go to your Twitter and be like, "What the fuck is Todd from Mario?" So, I mean. Okay, first of all, I'll say that, like, I changed my Twitter name to, like, fucked up shit all the time. Oh. There was some point during COVID where I just got bored of being, like, like too, I don't know, curated or something. Uh, where I was just, like, Wade Wolfgar, he's got a big dick, nah. And I was, like, I just, I'm bored. I need to do, I need to make this fun for myself. So I started making dumb names on Twitter, and people seem to be very entertained by it. So Todd for Mario, which is my current dumb Twitter name, is a reference to a YouTube show called Drawfee, where a group of friends do digital drawings together. It's just something that I like watching. Um, And at one point they did a stream where they basically mixed Toad from Mario, the little, the cute little mushroom guy from Mario with a possum. And they came up with Todd from Mario. And it's just very funny to me and they uh they ended up trying to sell t-shirts with todd from mario on them and they got a cease and desist from nintendo so they had to stop and i think that just makes it even funnier so that's what todd from mario is well i really appreciate you taking the time to do this way it has been a blast um likewise Wade, don't go anywhere. Uh, for those of you watching, I really hope that you enjoyed this. Um, again, you can find all of Wade's stuff, wadewolfgar.net, or it's listed at the top of his Twitter. You can find all my stuff below, and I hope you guys all have an amazing week. Hey guys, just wanted to say thank you for watching this video, and if you did really enjoy it, I just wanted to mention there are two ways that you can help to support this channel. On the right side, there are three little dots. If you click those, there is a super thanks button, and on the left-hand side, there is a join button where you can join this channel. 
there are three different tiers of memberships. The top tier does actually allow one-on-one -on -one messaging with me via Discord. And I personally answer that it is not a service. That's just, you know, both of those are ways that you can help support me as a content creator in this channel. I mention this because YouTube is by far the thing that I enjoy doing the most. It's the thing I'm most passionate about. And unfortunately, a lot of the sexual videos, the porn star confessions, the dom sub, all that stuff, it is not monetized due to the nature of the videos. But either way, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this. I hope you guys all have an absolutely amazing week. I love you all.